Hello. Um, I've never done something like this before, like a like a video blog sort of thing. Um, but I really wanted to address some of the things that have come up recently because inadvertently I, I caused kind of a shitstorm. And I really wanted to talk about it and get things off my chest. Uh, I don't have a script. I just have a few ideas, things I want to talk about, and I have a lot I want to go over, and I don't want to waste your time, but I have no idea how long this is going to be, so if, if if you look down at the at the time, it's like three hours long, by all means, fucking go. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge you if, if you don't want to listen to, you know, my ugly face ramble on for like a half an hour. Um, but yeah, so I am Redgrave. And I authored The Pale Blood Hunt. And it's sort of been the source of a lot of controversy lately, and I wanted to go over it. I don't really know where to begin, so I figured I would just start at the beginning and then sort of go from there. Uh, so, about two months ago, I published The Pale Blood Hunt on the Bloodborne subreddit. And it was the culmination of really a month of really intense hard work that I had, had put in. Um, it was a collection of countless, uh, hundreds of hours, really. I, I must have played through the game at least eight or nine times. I, I went through pages upon pages upon pages of, you know, wikis and item descriptions and and all of that sort of thing. And I, it's, and I published The Pale Blood Hunt for free online to anybody who wanted to read it. And the response to it was more than I had ever expected. Uh, for those of you who don't know what it is, it was basically my <laughs> dissertation on the lore, the story, the characters of Bloodborne. And the response was overwhelmingly positive, and it was more than I, I ever thought I was going to get. Um, I had, you know, so many people voicing how much they loved it. Uh, I had people sending me messages and I mean I got a shout, a shout out on like on Polygon's Let's Play. Like it was it was really great and I really loved the reception that it got. It was more than I had ever expected, honestly. And about a month later, uh, a friend of mine sent me a message on Skype saying, "Hey, have you seen Vati's Bloodborne video? And I said, no, I haven't. Uh, why? And he said, well, I can't help but notice that a lot of it looks like it comes from you. And I'm not going to lie, I was aware of a lot of the past events where Vati had been accused of lifting ideas and that sort of thing, but I went into it with an open mind. I watched the video, and I was very up upset by it. I, I'm, I'm not sure if upset is the right word. It was a, a very hard feeling to describe, but I did see a lot of elements, and this is where I want to bring up the first, and probably the biggest response I get from people who defend Vati to me, which is that because we're both interpreting one game and, and one story, we, we, you can't really plagiarize that because we're both working off of the source material. And I want to clarify real quick that, that not once ever have I ever accused Vati of plagiarizing my theories, my ideas, my interpretations. Not once. That's, that's not what made me so upset about the video. What made me upset was that it seemed that my unique and personal style of telling the Bloodborne story had been lifted. And that was what really made me upset. Because, you know, people other than me have come to the same conclusions that, uh, that I wrote in The Pale Blood Hunt. I'm, I'm not a special snowflake, you know. A lot of people came to the same ideas, and I, I, I'm not mad. You know, it, 
if you sitting at home come up with a similar idea, am I going to accuse you of plagiarism? No, it's ridiculous. Um, but a lot of of those the elements, excuse me, of how I told my story seem to have been lifted. And so I posted a thread on the Bloodborne subreddit asking other people for their opinion. Because I'm sorry, I just drank so much soda and burping like crazy. Um, and I wanted to get their opinion on whether they felt I was justified in being upset or whether they felt I was just being paranoid. And the response I got was very 50-50 with people saying, yeah, yeah, no, I totally see what you mean. And a lot of other people saying, no, you no, 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 you're crazy. But there was a, another faction of people that I, I didn't expect, which were a lot of people who just jumped on this on this bandwagon and uh, burn the witch, you know, saying, you know, f like fuck Valti, burn the witch, you know. And, it was, and I was totally not expecting that, which was there were a lot of people who just really sort of started this snowball effect of 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 this train, this hate train to Vaudeville. and that was not at all what I had expected. And not what I wanted either. I just wanted some kind of some kind of answer to the situation. And so a couple hours later, I got a message from Vati. Uh, he said he was really upset that I felt this way. He wanted to talk to me about it. Now he lives in Australia. I live in New York. So you know we couldn't talk immediately, but we set up a, a time and we talked the next day on Skype for about an hour. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of the details of that conversation because I don't really feel comfortable discussing all of it for obvious reasons. But there were a, a couple of things in particular that... And, and first of all, I, I, and I do want to say, it was not like a, like an angry conversation, you know. It was civilized. We, we, there was no yelling or ranting or screaming or shouting or, you know, it, we really just both wanted a, a solution you know, some kind of resolution to this, this whole issue. And so, you know, in the end, I asked him, like, outright, like, did you read my work? And what he said to me was that he had read the first part of it, but that he had stopped because he didn't want it to influence his opinions. And for me that answer never really stuck because he also told me and this is where the the bloodborne the the lovecraft quote comes up now <clears throat> i said before that the first the biggest response i got was people telling me you can't you know you can't plagiarize someone else's interpretation when you're both working on the same material the second most common response i got was people saying well that's the most common lovecraft quote in the world which to be fair, it, it's a very common quote. Um, the oldest and deepest emotion of mankind is fear, and fear of the unknown, yada yada yada. It's a quote from Supernatural Horror in Literature, an essay that Lovecraft published in 1927, I believe. Um, I've been a huge, huge fan of Lovecraft for a long time. I've read all of his works, all of his essays, thousands of times. It's naturally one of the reasons why I was so engrossed with Bloodborne to an extent that I hadn't been in Dark Souls 1 or 2. I had been in Demon Souls, but not in Dark Souls 1 and 2. Uh, to the level that I had been in Bloodborne was because of that cosmic horror element. And on the surface, it, it, it's a very simple quote about how the un unknown things are scary, but it's not actually what the, the quote was about. He wrote it in his essay, Supernatural Horror in Literature. It's the most comprehensive history of... That's my cat. He's loud. <laughs> it's the most comprehensive, comprehensive essay on horror literature up to his point in time. Obviously, there's no Stephen King in it, which would be if, you know... If you were writing it after Lovecraft, you'd talk about Lovecraft and Stephen King, and then you'd be at the present. Um, obviously, he doesn't talk about it, but he talks about Hawthorne and Dunsany and Poe and all those great figures and the whole gothic, uh, you know, horror thing. And But the, what the quote is really about, 
and he, he opens the essay with it. It's a quote about the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. And it's not about fearing aliens and that sort of thing. It's about people not wanting to expand their minds, so to speak, about the literature, about the idea of these cosmic horrors, and about how people didn't want to have these terrible ideas with horrifying, very uncomfortable consequences, because they were scared of, of that kind of story, where it's all beyond them and there's nothing they can do and people didn't want to experience that kind of story they wanted something grounded more to earth something they could be in control of and that's what they were afraid of was that kind of helplessness in those stories and it was a it's and so i really really honestly it's the last thing i put in the pale blood hunt before i published it i was I decided at the end that I wanted to have a quote from Lovecraft just to sort of have an homage to him in the beginning. And yet, I, I could not decide on one, and I went through a thousand quotes. I was really settled on, like, a quote from the moon and about the moon and all that stuff, but I, I, I ended up settling on that quote. And I, I put a lot of thought into it. And when I brought this up to Vadi, he said that, and in his defense, he was correct. He said that when he put Lovecraft quotes into Google, it was one of the first ones that came up. And, and he's right. It is one of the first quotes that comes up when you put Lovecraft quotes into Google. Um, and he said that he had just gotten it like that, and, you know, he, he, he didn't see. But if you recall, he told me that he read the first part of the Pale Blood Hunt. And I I feel like when he told me about the quote, I caught him in a lie, and I think he knew it. Because the comment, I read the first part of the Pale Blood Hunt, and the comment, I didn't get the quote from you, never really meshed together for me. I could never consolidate the two, because what did if he read the first part of my work he obviously must have seen the quote and I, I i do think i caught him in a lie and i don't know why exactly he lied but i think he knew that i had caught him in a lie because after we discussed the quote the conversation got a lot more withdrawn um, it, it ended pretty quickly after that because we both sort of realized that we were not going to come to a satisfying conclusion. And that was pretty much left at that. That's pretty much, I pretty much just left it at that. I went on with my life. I moved on. I, and I'm not going to lie. I was upset. I was angry. I was frustrated. I was, there was a lot of emotions. But in the end, I just sort of moved on. Um, and then... About two weeks ago, I got a message from Aegon of Astora, who I'm sure, if you're watching this video, you're familiar with. Um, Aegon told me that he was starting a new Bloodborne Let's Play, and he wanted to discuss my lore while he was doing it, and he also mentioned that he was aware of the whole Fatividya plagiarism accusation, and... If you know about Aegon, you know that there was a very big sort of commotion, uh, you know, ignoring the commotion going on right now, uh, you know, a few months back about the Lucatiel or Lucadiel video. I don't know how to pronounce her name, actually, but I say Lucadiel because I think it sounds cooler. Um, and so I was aware of that, and I said, yeah, you know, I'd be, that you can, t that's totally cool. I'd actually, you know, I was like, I'm a huge fan of it. I actually was a big fan of his. His, and it's a shame, and we'll get to, you know, him taking his stuff down later. But it's a shame he did take his stuff down because his video on Jura, it was one of my favorite, was one of my favorite, absolute favorite, um, Souls-related videos I've ever seen. 
And so I was a fan of his. And so I was like, yeah, absolutely. And I'll be happy to, if you want to bounce ideas off me, t totally cool, happy, you know, all that sort of thing. And that was the last I heard from him uh, until two days ago. And two days ago, he published a video entitled Vati Vidya, Patreon, or Patreon supported plagiarist, which I'm sure if you're watching this video, you've heard of. Um, now, objectively speaking, the video is incredibly well made. Even if you're for or against Vati, it's a very well made video, if only because everything you need to know about the situation can be found within that video. Uh, all the sources are there. You can, if you have any questions about anything he talks about, there's a wall of text in the description where you can look at everything. You can look at all the threads he took everything from. You can look at all of Vat Vati's videos he took everything from. You, so all that information is really there. As for the video itself, it is really well done. Personally, if I had been the one doing it, I probably would have omitted the last five to ten minutes where he and I don't think this was his intention but he starts to really sort of go after Vati's character uh, the portrayal of him on the Bonfireside chat podcast um, seemed a little unnecessary to me and the remarks about Let's Plays, I think, specifically hit a chord with Aegon, because Aegon, the majority of his content were Let's Plays. So I think he was particularly offended by that. And I don't think he really... I don't think he really got his message across the way he intended. It, it came off a, a little aggressive and a little unnecessary. But I think the most important thing to note is that it got a lot of attention. Like, a lot of attention. Now, when I made my thread accusing Vati, not accusing, but, but suggesting Vati may have plagiarized me, I got a lot of angry messages from people telling me I was an asshole, telling me that I just wanted his viewers, I don't even have, you know, I don't even make videos other than this one. Uh, but telling me that I was jealous. And that was the one that hurt the most, I think. It was the one when people told me I was jealous of him. And I think the, the reason it hurt the most was because at, a, at some level it was true. I, and I was jealous of him. And I still kind of am. Because, you know, he, he makes this living off of his passion. He has so many fans. And, and you know, the comments that that hurt you the most are the ones that have that kind of ring of truth to them. And so I think that's the, the one that hurt me the most. And I got a lot of these messages. You know, like my inbox was flooded. And Aegon's video, which got maybe 50,000 views in 24 hours. Now, I can't, I can't speak for Aegon. Um, and in Vati's response, he, he, he wrote that he had gotten death threats and if you think he was making that up to defend himself or something, to make it paint himself as a victim, you've never been on the spotlight in an internet argument because the kinds of messages you will receive... Look, and I play Dota, so I'm used to getting flamed for no fucking reason, but the kinds of messages you will receive when the spotlight is on you in like an internet drama storm, you have no idea if you've never been there. It's It's really crazy. So if you think for one second that Vati's making up the fact that people sent him death threats, you have no idea. Um, and, and so Aegon's video got maybe 10,000 times the attention that my post had gotten. So I can't even imagine what kinds of video, what kinds of, you know, messages he sent me. Um, right after he released the video, you know, we were talking about it a little bit. And he told me that he had been really obsessed, kind of, with this video, and that it had really sort of taken over his life for the past week to an uncomfortable amount, and that he couldn't sleep because of it. He just he had to focus on it and focus on it and focus on it. He really just poured a lot of energy into it, and um, you know, unlike me, there's absolutely no shred of jealousy in Aegon. I, I can't speak for him, but he is, he has, he does 
stuff outside of the soul stuff way more stuff than that this is really small time thing for him so you know uh, what I'm trying to say is I think he was kind of upset by how much this had affected him and what really upset him the most I think was how people misinterpreted and sort of didn't really didn't really take in the video and sort of just got it wrong um uh, there was an article on Kotaku by Patrick Klepek. I don't I think that's how you pronounce his last name. And it's a really really shittily written video uh, article. It's a really scummy article actually. Um I mean first of all Patrick Klepek should never have been allowed to write that article because he's actually very good friends with Vati. Um you know he he and Vati tweet at each other and he's done interviews of Vati in the past. And, you know, they email each other and they talk, like, they're, they're friends. And it's a really, really terrible conflict of interest to have a friend of someone who's being accused of these things write the article. But uh, not even that. Ignoring that, I can, I can put that aside for us. I mean, we all know that video game journalism is a fucking joke. So I can even put that aside. But the article is written in a really scummy manner. Uh, it, it opens by <laughs> saying that Vati is being accused by a rival souls lore analyzer. And it paints this really sort of nasty, it sets this nasty stage for the whole situation because there, it makes it sound like it's one of Vati's competition sort of accusing him. And there's no competition going on. You know, it, it, we're not racing to the finish line to get the lore first. You know, it's, it's, a collab, it's this huge collaborative effort. And that really sort of painted a, a very bad image and then it started going on and on about the plagiarism software. Now, this, this is number three on the things that people ask me about. And it said that, that Aegon put, you know, Vati's transcription into this plagiarism software, and there's no way of knowing if it was triggered by item descriptions and stuff like that. And, and first of all, he didn't fucking put it in, <laughs> into the plagiarism software. And... Before you send me a message, neither did I. I've had so many messages from people asking me what I put into the Blazers book. I didn't even, I, I, I didn't even know it existed that people had done this on game FAQs. Um, so I, I had no part in that. But, and the worst part of it is that it's that's all in the video. It, it it's all clearly documented in the video. What was put into the software? When it was put in? By whom it was put in? All that stuff is is right there in the video and if you took even a minute to open the thread that's linked in the description and you went to the game FAQs thread and you read it you could clearly see what was and what wasn't and all that stuff and it was all right there and I think the idea that a lot of people were sort of bringing up these accusations that you know maybe false positive because of item descriptions and oh I can't believe Aegon put in only such and such words like, did you even watch the video? Did you even do your research? That sort of thing. And I think those were the comments that sort of really pushed him over the edge. He he told me that he had really sort of neglected... He didn't tell me this, actually. I don't want to misquote. He, he made a post where he said that he had really sort of neglected his personal and his professional life because of this video, and he didn't want to do that. And so he put all his videos to private, and the the Vati accusation video is unlisted right now. So you can actually you can only get to it if you have the link. And I think he did it really because he was so upset by the response he got, and maybe he got the response rightfully so. Maybe he was too aggressive. Maybe he was too... whatever. Um, but I, I really want... So that's where we're at right now. And I really want to sort of just address the issue at hand right here. Because what Aegon says in, in his video is, this isn't about plagiarism, it's about community. And I think that's right. So... I want to go back to what Vati told me 
which is that he didn't read my work because he didn't want it to color his opinion. And to me, that seems so pointless because the whole point of the Souls games is to work together. If you look back at Demon Souls, for example, uh, you know, say you you just died to the Man Eaters or the Flame Lurker for the ten thousandth time, you're trudging back up through three two or through two two or whatever. You get to the Fog Gate, you look down, and you see a message that says, you know, I've been in Soul form for so long, or you know, the true Demon Soul starts here, and it makes you feel better. Because it, it makes you, it gives you this sort of sense of solidarity. And that's what the messages were put for. That's the reason behind them, is to sort of give this communal team spirit, as cheesy as it sounds. And then you, you know, you go into the boss fight, and you can see phantoms of other players fighting their own versions of the boss. And you know, it sort of spurs you on, and it gives you that sort of motivation, because we're all in this together. And then, you know, when you play Dark Souls, for example, Dark Souls 1, and you meet Lawtrick for the first time, if you're like me and you play Demon Souls, you cut that motherfucker down because you knew exactly what kind of bullshit Miyazaki was trying to pull. <laughs> um, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Um, <laughs> that's not the point. So w when, you're, when you're playing Dark Souls 1 for the first time and you, and you run into Lawtrick, you know, he's behind this cage, he's going, hey, can you help me out? Oh, the, uh, I got trapped behind here. You know where the key is, and you've got the key. And you're about to let him out, and you looked at it, and there's a message. And, it's a, and it's not a message left by the developers. It's not a message left in the game. It's a message left by another player. And it says, you know, beware of liar. And th that message changes your whole way of perceiving that situation. The, your, it, it changes everything about that situation because you know you start to think about it differently, you start to look at it a certain way, you start to process it uh, differently, and it's not because of something that the developers put in. It's because of the communal effort. And that's really how I see the soul's lore in addition to the soul's gameplay is that it's not like one person goes in to a secluded monastery and they sit down and they meditate about the lore and then they come out like Moses from you know the mountainside with 10 commandments and they preach to the masses it's it's not at all like that it's a chain you know one per, you know one person on the thread says hey what about this character? And someone says, oh, I don't know. Did you see this reference? And someone goes, oh, that's cool. Look at this item description. And then he goes, oh, I saw this in this video. And it sort of links together and together and together. And it forms this sort of greater, deeper understanding of everything because everybody's working together towards one goal. And that, to me, is the worst part of what Vati is suggesting. Suggesting excuse me, about himself, which is that he exists, or that, not that he exists, but that he, that his work operates in a, in a bubble, that it's not, that it's influenced from the community as little as possible. Because it's not true. It's, it's really not. You cannot live in a bubble. You can't, make the incredible videos he makes and they are incredible the production value the narration the music it's very well done but you you can't operate like that in a bubble especially with you know a game like dark souls or demon souls or bloodborne it's it's everybody working together towards a common goal and that's what sort of hurts me so much is because all Vati has to do and is is do this is just one he just has to not even in the video just in the description say thanks to the souls community for their continuing effort in understanding the games and, and the story and the characters and if he did that I think a lot of the hate would sort of die down because Vati you're 
you're you're not an an innovator you're an aggregate and there's nothing wrong with that you know and you've said this yourself like that you take all of the ideas and you swirl them and uh, you know thomas edison didn't invent the light bulb but he did he was the first person to make it commercially viable and to bring it to the masses like that and it's called con edison it's not called con tesla so there's nothing wrong with being that aggregate but you can't pretend that you aren't and and you say you don't pretend that you are but by staying silent on the issue of of whether you are by, by sort of waffling between you you are saying that you're independent of it and i think that's what this is all about is that community because going on it alone going at it alone you know going over the soul's lore alone like that it's just like playing a souls game in offline mode i mean what's the point sure the the challenge is there but you miss out on so much and it's it's really such a shame and I don't know. I don't. I don't really have much else to say. Um, even if nobody watches this, it's it feels really good just to get everything off my chest. It feels like closure. Um. I don't know. If you, thank you for watching. If you've stuck with me. God knows how long. I'm not even going to know how long this is until I look at the time. And I really fucking hope it's not over 20 minutes. But I know it is. I fucking know it is. But I really hope it's not. Um, but thank you for watching. And I really appreciate it. Um, and if you have anything to say, you can always send me a message on Reddit. I'll have, I'll have my information down below. You can always feel free to send me a message at any time. Or you can send me a message here on this YouTube channel. Um, and that's really all I had to say, so thank you for listening.